Thanks, everybody. Welcome to Build. I'm your host, Ricky Camilleri, and our next guests are two of the stars of the upcoming racing movie, Ford v. Ferrari. In it, Matt Damon and Christian Bale attempt to buck the corporate bureaucratic structure of the behemoth car company Ford by creating a car fast enough to beat Ferrari at the 24-hour Le Mans. Representing that bureaucratic structure in two very different ways are the great John Bernthal and the great Josh Lucas. Let's take a look at Ford v. Ferrari. How long have we known each other, Ken? I ever break a promise to you? I will put you in the driver's seat at Le Mans. You just shut your mouth and let me do my thing. All right. Come here. Morning, Shelby. Morning, Molly. Up yours. I'll go to hell. the 24 hours of Le Mans for the fifth consecutive year. Mr. Ford, Ferrari has a message for you, sir. What did he say? He said Ford makes ugly little cars in an ugly factory. And, uh, he called you fat, sir. We're gonna bury Ferrari at Le Mans. So the great Carol Shelby is gonna build a car to beat Ferrari with a Ford. Correct. And how long did you tell them you needed? Two or three hundred years? Ninety days. <laughs> Ford hates guys like us because we're different. Well, we heard he's difficult. Ken? No, no, Ken's a puppy dog. If there's a problem, the computer will find it. Get some scotch tape and a ball of wool. What are they doing? Making your car faster. Ah! That's my Ken Miles is not a Ford man. We're on the verge of something. And now you tell me that I can't have the best man in the world behind the wheel? Give me one reason why I don't fire everyone starting with you. Well, sir, we're lighter, we're faster. So nice. And that don't work, we're nastier. Go ahead, girl. Go to war. Go to plan. It's high risk. I thought the whole point was to win the damned race. If this were a beauty pageant, we just lost. Looks on everything. Everybody, please welcome John Bernthal and Josh Lucas. Let's hear it. Uh, guys, thanks so much for being here. Congrats on this movie. Happily. Uh, I have to ask right off the bat, what is it like working with James Mangold? Because as a director, I consider him to be formidable and a humongous talent, but one of the things that I love about watching his work is that it seems as though he never feels the need to call attention to himself as a director. You have to kind of look for a lot of the craft and the beautiful shots. It's never... He's never at any point like, look at this five minute one -er that's gonna blow your mind. You know, he's very much about the story the whole time, but so, it's all there. Sorry to bore you with the same story. He's only, I've only told it a couple times, but there's this point when we were making the movie where we we're in the Ford factory. And you have to remember in order to build the Ford factory, they had to collect Ford Fairlanes, 1964 Ford Fairlanes from all over the country, um, a casting call for the cars. They then had to take them apart in different phases, reconstruct them and build this factory that was in an abandoned warehouse in Los Angeles. The level of detail was insane um, all over the entire movie. Uh, and there, in order to do it, there's a big scene where Henry Ford, Tracy Letts plays Henry Ford, comes out and gives this um, emotional speech about how the Ford Motor Company is about to fail, which is why this whole story begins. And in the process, there was hundreds of extras and cars and huge moving parts to take to the scene and mangled was watching the scene, I was watching him watch the scene with the director of photography and with the script supervisor, and he was very agitated about the fact that there was an extra in the background of one of the shots who kept kind of doing something strange with his hand. And Mangold got more and more agitated about this, and the DP kept saying, like, what is your problem? Why are you paying attention to the extra in the back of the scene? Like, nobody's going to be paying attention to him. They're going to be paying attention to the cars. They're going to be paying attention to Tracy Letts, to Henry Ford. Like, what's the problem? And he goes, I am a doctor. I don't pay attention to the face I pay attention to the pancreas. And to me, that is a perfect representation of who Mangold is. Like he's somebody who, the level of depth and detail and focus that he's at 
is on the granular level um, because he knows the big elements are likely working. Um, his obsession to detail is extraordinary, which is actually at its core kind of what the movie is about. It's about this obsession for excellence, about the search for the perfect mo moment, perfect lap in a way. When you say that uh, the devil is kind of in the details and that's what he's hunting for, how does that affect you guys as actors on the scene? Because you guys are part of the big picture, your your pros essentially, and is that is that like you show up to set and he knows that you're going to do what what he wants and so therefore he can focus on other things? And you know you're in, you know, enormously you know, great hands who, you know, he's got a, such a vision for, for, for all of this. But I think, yeah, I think you recognize very quickly that you're not just part of a, an acting ensemble, but you're part of this giant machine that, that, that is his vision. And, you know, the level of skill and professionalism, it, it, the art in this movie is so incredible. The, the costumes are so incredible. It's, it's an old school way of making movies. There's nothing digital about it. So in the scene that, you know, Josh is talking about, you know, you really are in this giant factory and there really are hundreds, if not thousands of extras. And when you say they're, they're background performers, great actors who are delivering great performances and, and everyone looks so right and feels so right and everybody has been sort of meticulously picked out and, and um, everything is completely and utterly on purpose. Uh, so so it, it really did feel like kind of a, a throwback movie and something I think we all considered ourselves enormously grateful to be a part of, but, but also that we are part of something that really doesn't happen very often. And, you know, I use the example of they, they, they can do a close up on someone's face and the camera is only on someone's face, but behind the camera, Jim will run, you know, three or four race cars at 200 miles per hour behind just so you feel it just so. And, and that sort of appreciation for the craft and appreciation for the way movies are made and, 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 and to build the atmosphere where we're playing is uh, it speaks volumes about, about Jim and the kind of filmmaker he is. Most of your guys' scenes are with, um, well, not most, but with Tracy Letts, right? Um, he's a, a, a monster, uh, one of the great monsters of theater and movies. What is it like working with him? Well, I think when you say monster, I think you mean in terms of the talent, because yes. I, I mean, truly, like he's a, you know, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning, Tony Prize, Tony Award winning actor and playwright, which is almost entirely unheard of. Um, the reality, we have this strange thing on this movie. Tracy Letts is a beautiful, soulful guy. A young, he's a father of a young child. We, we, Tracy and John and I were talking about this. Why was this experience so positive? And there was this consistent thing where I think everybody on this movie had a young child. And so at the core, all of us, we were sort of sacrificing being there because the movie took an extraordinary commitment in terms of time. Um, we were all away from our kids and families every day for a pretty long period of time. Um, but that there was this genuine sense of we were all in something together that was important, that we were struggling to make something great because it mattered to us deeply. Um, and that there was a real friendship amongst the group of people there doing it because we all really would like to be home with our kids, but we knew we had this job to do. Um, you also had a wonderful thing to talk about in between setups as well. <laughs> you were at that point where you trading, still wanted trading to talk about stories, your child. Exactly. Yeah. And also just like not a lot of like bullshit baby boy ego stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like everybody like thoroughly was, uh, y you know, there's a real strategy among the players and we really would like kind of break down scenes and, and we all, you, you know, it's just a very... It, it was a very adult experience, you know. Everybody was really there only for one reason, and and um, there was no sort of, uh, you know, jockeying for for position or yeah. the, you know no you know weird masculinity issues. You know, everybody was just very much. It was very supportive, and 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 we were all very much a, a team with a very specific goal in mind. Yeah, that's so much of what the movie is about: jockeying for position and and masculinity issues at this time, yep. especially in terms of your two characters, whereas your character is sort of willing to buck the corporate structure in some ways, mm -hmm. small ways, and yours is just all about the corporate structure and making sure that Henry Ford II is your best buddy uh, all, all the way through. What sort of research did you guys do into uh, Leo Beebe and Lee Iacocca prior to, to help you with the roles? I think one of the things that fascinated me and I think Mangold and the screenwriters and everyone 
is not to get into anything political in terms of what's going on in the world today, but there was a sense that Leo Beebe was a loyalist. Yep. I mean, he truly believes in his uh, great buddy, Henry Ford II. They were in a tank together in World War II. He deeply believes in the identity of the Ford Motor Company as an American, iconic, important institution. And the, the idea back then, that the, the term the, a Ford man used to really mean something. The way that the FBI had a, a sense during J. Edgar Hoover's time that, that you dressed a certain way, you looked a certain way, you even talked a certain way, and there was a certain level of integrity that went with that. Very much that was the case with Ford at the time, and that BB, the character I would play, strongly believes in that, and strongly believes in post-world America going a certain direction. And that Ken Miles, who Christian Bale plays, and Carol Shelby, who Matt Damon plays, they're the wrong direction. That they're hippies, they're kind of loose and artist, or they're kind of artistic, and they're kind of an individual identity. Beatniks, as he yeah, beatniks, is refers exactly. to them at one point, and right? You know, Matt says at one point, you know, that beatnik landed a right. busted tank in D-Day. <laughs> He's like, yeah, but he doesn't dress the right way. And there's a sense that B.B. believed in it. And, um, you know, the research really came down. The script was there. A lot of it was this weird thing that with the hairstyle that Leo B.B. had, which you look at all photographs of Leo B.B. He had this ridiculously complicated, like, reverse pompadour that nobody wore anything like that. So there was a level of ego that I knew was immediately inherent in the character that he would wear this hair and the way he dressed was immaculate and all these different things and I think that they were for him deeper in terms of they weren't just being a certain level of ego it was more about presenting a certain idea that he thought was important there is also a sense of how far he's willing to go to be right in front of Henry Ford the second right there's a I, sense there's a moment in the movie and it doesn't necessarily go there where it's like is he willing to sabotage this entire operation just so he can say I told you to Henry Ford II? I think that's a great question that I don't have the answer to. I do know that B.B. defended this decision to the end of his life. Yeah. He really thought it was the right thing to do. And the reality is, is when people see the movie, this movie is being made partly because of the decision that Leo B.B. made and that Leo B.B. demanded and that you know, Carol Shelby, to the end of his life, um, regrets the choice that he made um, by BB following also, Libby's deci BB's decision. Basically. And BB also says that it was mostly a, a safety concern rather than it was. Yeah, I know. I I, I know, but that's that's his defense. Uh, <laughs> I'm skeptical of, it. of that, even yeah. though I'm playing that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, Iacocca ended up becoming the CEO of Ford at one point. He's recognized as one of the great American CEOs. Uh, what sort of research did you have to do? I mean, do you have to do research when a script is this sort of well fleshed out? I, th I think, uh, y y you know, I think yes and no. I think it's completely sort of uh, particular to, to, to you and your, your process. I, 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 we were talking about it earlier. I think there's certain filmmakers who, you know, really don't only welcome kind of the research or to, to, to have the real folks that the, the story's about to be on set and to kind of have the right and, and, and to demand them to say, hey, this isn't actually how it happened, almost to be sort of recreationist in a way. And, and, uh, and then there's other filmmakers, great filmmakers, who say, we don't want the real people you know, anywhere near here you know, because we're, we're, we're using our imagination. We're creating something here. This is an act of cinema. Yeah. Exactly. As so to documentation. Exactly. Yeah. So I, you know, I, I think for me in this, it, this was its own kind of unique challenge because there is, there's, there's, there's so much you know, Lee Iacocca out there in the world. And, and uh, you know, everyone kind of my age grew up seeing that book and seeing him on TV and commercials. And he, he was, he's a real titan of industry. And I, I think, you know, you know, could have been president and, and you know, um, was, was revered and loved. Um, but everything we know about him was when he was sort of at the apex of his success, right. unbelievably confident and comfortable. And the challenge here was then to sort of like take that man and what you know about him and all this wealth of information and then strip away the veneer of success and, and, and what do you have? And to me, I mean, the, the, the real, my real draw to this was really, I, I saw a lot of my own father in him. Um, Blue collar guy, grew, grew up in a very blue collar community, son of immigrants, very much a fish out of water in this, you know, enormously blue blood company that that didn't necessarily re respect him and didn't necessarily give him a fair shot because uh, he was a son of immigrants. And that was a very real thing. And, uh, you know, I think he did think outside the box and he always was an outsider and he did really recognize how much the country was changing. And it was a company that was very much resistant to change. Um, and, uh, 
you know, I, 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 I see him as, you know, what I, what I know about him through the research and talking to people in his family is he's a fiercely uh, loyal and, and um, ethical and kind person. He, he valued honesty and reputation. And um, he's enormously caught in the middle in, in, in this film. And he's enormously uncomfortable at, 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 at all times. And he's, it's, it's a tightrope walk for him. And um, I think when you juxtapose that with this you know, iconic, comfortable, successful character figure that we all sort of know of Lee Iacocca, that's where it kind of gets interesting. Well, he's, he's inter his character in the film is interesting because he is a cross-section between B.B. and something that would maybe be rebellious towards B.B. because he's not really willing to put that much of his ass on the line, but he is willing to put maybe a little bit of his ass on the line. Yeah, I think it's that, that thing of saying, you know, a lot of kind of middlemen, you know, we, we were having this conversation before when you're dealing with, you know, artists and producers. I was and getting agents. to that, too. And How much of this film, movie is about making a studio movie? So much. I mean, so much is this, like, you know, Jim's sort of, yeah. you, you know, reckoning and Jim's dealing with this and, like, you know, the the, the, the purity of the artist in a, in a very corporate world. And I think he, I think Iacocca is the kind of guy that says, look, in order to do this, in order, we have big thoughts, we have big aspirations, we're trying to do something great, we need to employ, enable, and support free thinkers and unbelievable artists and 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 support their vision and but we also then need to go to the artists and the free thinkers and them and say hey look you know sometimes you're gonna have to play a little bit of ball like i got your back but like sometimes it's gonna look like i'm not really getting your back but i really am getting your back and that's really hard for the artist or or or, or the athlete or the you know the talent to 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 really gel with or understand. So he's really caught in the middle. He understands the structure. He understands the steps that one takes. And he also knows we need these guys in order to, to, to make this change and in order to grow and in order to achieve something, you know, um, extraordinary. How much, uh, when you guys read the scripts and we, the script and when you guys got on set, how much were you thinking about studio execs that you may have known, productions that you may have been a part of in the past where you've seen people sort of meddling with the director or meddling with the artistic vision of it for the purposes of their uh, own employment, gainful employment? I don't think any of us were directly thinking about that from our own experiences, but I do know that Jim probably is and was, particularly, I think, with the Leo BB character because BB's character very much represents the studio exec who's on set, who's limiting the director and the you know the choices that are being made at all times for the sake of budget usually is what it is right but those people i, I read a really interesting review of the movie where it talked about sometimes those those people like i'm not just defending leo bibi here but sometimes those people really they have the same best interest of the film at heart you know and that i do think look this decision again i'm kind of giving away something in the movie but the decision that leo bibi demanded on this story um, the choice that he 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 made happen um, did something incredible, you know. It did something incredible. We're making a movie out of it, so I, I do think again those people sometimes, as much as the fight is there, their fight is actually sometimes for the exact same um, finished product in a way. And I don't I would agree with you. I would say like in the last couple of years, since streaming services have come out, there's been a host of movies where I've been like, oh, this maybe would have done better with a couple executive notes or <laughs> someone <laughs> stepping in to be like, That's a great trim it just a little bit sure. maybe, you know, because apparently there's no one paying attention to that. And every now and then they are there in service of the, of the, the best possible product. And oftentimes those people like the Harvey Weinsteins are very difficult people. Yes. You know, they, they, I'm talking not to per, take the personal stuff away. I'm talking just the essence of the studio mogul, the studio exec. Oftentimes their job is to challenge and force um, creative thinkers to, to play a different way than they necessarily would want to, which again gets into some of the big identity elements of this movie, which I think is what sets it apart and why people, or why people are consistently th saying that this movie is so much bigger than a car movie because it's about conce concepts. It's about you know creativity. It's about corporations. It's about po it's so big. Yeah, the structure of the drama isn't limited to car racing or the movie industry. It's really any sort of corporate structure that you're in when you're trying to battle or have ideas or make something new and David and versus Goliath, you know, yeah. really, truly. Absolutely. Uh, you know, you guys said that there was no ego on set primarily because you all had small children and that you were talking about that a lot. But one of the things that I think is noticeable in regards to ego, not that he has an ego at all, is that Bale is giving one like a classic Bale performance where he's completely transformative and a different person, yet the movie doesn't feel like it lingers or fetishizes 
criticizes that performance in any way, it feels, again, like it is in service of everybody else's story and the story as a whole. Uh, what is it like watching him show up to set and, and be that person? I mean, famously, he was doing this accent at the Golden Globes while you guys were shooting it or something like that. Yeah, I, I mean, look, you know, I, I think really, you, you know, both of those guys, I, I think everybody in the cast really was just, uh, you, you know, great and, and and came with it you know kind of bringing everything i for me i think just seeing matt and christian they they, they just have such different approaches and they're they're these i mean they're they're heroes of of, of mine and, and i i'm sure i can speak for josh and uh, you know they, they've been with us they're 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 like a part of you know cinema uh history you know that i mean we, we we've we've seen so many of their characters but to me, it just their, their approach is so different. You know, M Matt is like so uh, unbelievably uh, effortless. You know, and 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 Christian is 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 approaching it from this kind of other way, and he's attacking all the time. And uh, and um, you know, it's a real and and I and and even though they do come about it in such you know completely sort of different ways. You know, together their 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 chemistry is 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 beautiful and and honest and and I and I, and I do think that that comes from being really selfless and open and there's there's no literally no sense of you know hey you're you're like a challenge to me it's like what can we build together and 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 that I really think uh, I know was just you know flowed through the entire cast and the entire set everyone I think everyone really understood how lucky we were to be there because you're making this kind of this kind of movie and 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 you're being afforded the opportunity to 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 do it for real not do it with a bunch of green screens and and pretend right it's an original it's an original non ip movie for that cost upwards of like 100 million dollars which is like this is one of two of those this year this and maybe once upon a time in hollywood yeah. I think. Uh, did you want to talk about that as well, working with well, Christian? Well, what I want to say about Christian particularly, uh, one of the reasons I really wanted to do this is I did American Psycho with him, you know, right. so long ago. You recently said that you th at first thought he was going to be bad in the movie, but I, then... When I was making American Psycho, the first couple of days of shooting, I was like, this guy's terrible. <laughs> um, and, you know, obviously I've been proven wildly wrong. Uh, but really what it is, is I think that we as cinema goers identify Christian Bale as an actor who's obsessed by perfection. And if you look at this movie, there's that beautiful scene between him, him and Noah Jupe when he says, you know, but you can't, al you can't always get the perfect lap. And Christian says, no, but you can try. Mm -hmm. And so the casting of the movie is so important because I think we look at Christian as an actor who searches for that. And like you say, maybe his performances almost overwhelm the films because of his greatness. Um, and I think in this case, he served, you know, because of, again, Mangled and their relationship having worked together for a couple times, but again, I, we were all in the same exact drive, which was to make a movie that was deeply great, you know, and deeply and more interesting than any race car movie that has ever been made. And that, that we really wanted to make a movie that was surprising at all sorts of different levels. And that really came from Mangled, but really from Christian and Matt as well. And that their, not just professionalism, but their, their sense of integrity towards that idea I mean, the same way the movie is about their integrity towards making this mind-blowing car that could beat Ferrari when it had never been done before. That was kind of the same thing that we were trying to do here. Forgive me if I said that his performances overwhelm films. No, they, I, he, I love when directors fetishize his performances because his performances are yeah. incredible. You know, you never, which if he's going to zig or zag, he's an incredible actor. Mm -hmm. But it is amazing to watch someone be like, you know, you are in service mm -hmm. to a, a, a much larger story with an ensemble cast. He never gets an ensemble, you know, which this movie primarily is. I think Christian is such, he's one of the greatest actors I think of all time. And I think because of that, it's very easy for any story then to focus on that. And Daniel Day-Lewis, I think yeah. you could say, suffers from the same problem <laughs> where he's, he, you know, he overwhelms the, his greatness overwhelms the movie and the character. And um, that's not their problem. <laughs> it's someone else's problem. When you were, uh, I'm curious about the American Psycho uh, story. When you were doing it, were you the only actor who felt that way? Or were well, the other actors kind of curious about what he was doing as Christian well? Christian told the story the other night, because I, I told him the story and he said, what's interesting is that he found out later that Willem Dafoe was very concerned. <laughs> Willem Dafoe, I guess, said to Mary Heron something along the lines of like, what is this guy doing? Because his performance was so complicated and strange and at the time watching it 
I thought, and basically what it is is because he's so bold. Mm -hmm. He's so so wildly fearless. I've been lucky to work with a couple of amazing actors in my life, Sean Penn, Russell Crowe, and what the defining factor is, they all have wildly different personalities, but the defining factor is that they are fearless when it comes down to making choices and trying things, and they are throwing you know paint all over the walls, and... Um, I would say that, you know, for even though we knew him as a young actor from Empire of the Sun, still he hadn't proven himself as an adult actor to that point, to the level that I think that's the beginning of his ascent into, you know, being truly one of the greatest film actors of all time. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from Twitter. It's a question for the two of you guys. What car do you drive? Are you good at teaching someone to drive? Speaking from a born and bred New York City gal who has depended on public transportation all her life, FYI, I don't know anything about cars. He he, is that a real tweet? I feel like tweets aren't can't be that long. <laughs> so it's like seven questions inside this 140 character tweet. What kind of car do you guys drive? Want to take it? Bro? We both drive Ford yeah. pickup trucks. <laughs> so and John races his, and I don't. <laughs> I drive mine pickup? very slow. I, 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 I like race against the own clock in my head, not not <laughs> against other people. But yeah, I drive pretty fast. You're yeah. not drag racing down no, like I'm not. Oh, okay. no, I'm not. A uh, couple questions from the audience. Who is it? Right here. Hi. Um, what is next for you, and what do you like to do in your free time between the projects? Uh, young kids. Yeah, I, I have I have three little little ones, and and I live out in the country, so. Uh, that that's what I like to do, sort sort of period. I mean, uh, for me, um, my life's pretty pretty streamlined. It's it's uh, y you know it's either work or I'm I'm with my family and uh, my wife and my kids are just kind of everything to me. Um, I coach them and everything, and I'm I just they're 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 my life. Um, movie wise, I I did the uh, Sopranos prequel, uh, which is which is going to come out next year, and I did a movie with my friend Taylor Sheridan. Um, and uh, I have a movie called Small Engine Repair based on a play that we did. It's coming out in um, a little mini series on FX with uh, uh, BJ Novak wrote. So some exciting stuff. But right now, uh, thankfully, as soon as we get out of here, I'm going home to my kids. John, I have a feeling you might do something else in your spare time. Are you wearing uh, legalization, legalized I marijuana am, I socks? Am, I am, <laughs> it's actually one thing. He always wears them, by the way. Seriously, I don't think I've ever you know not seen to, you. If you know what to get me as a gift, you know everybody who knows me just weed socks, man, or weed. But like, <laughs> yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but yes, I am. Wow, I, I didn't even realize. I love it. Yeah, answered yeah. that spare time question. Fair enough. Uh, spare time. Well, I don't like my kid at all, so I'm trying to <laughs> spend as much time away from him yeah. as possible. Um, you know, similar to John, I think uh, my son is probably, if not absolutely, easily the top priority of my life. Uh, so as soon as I get out of here, that's what I go back to as well. But I have an interesting film coming out next, which is based on the wildly popular um, books and ideas, The Secret, which is very much about the law of positive, the law of attraction. Um, the idea of positive thinking brings positive things to your life and negative thinking brings negative things to your life. And um, that book has obviously been a global sensation. And the director of Sweet Home Alabama took it and tweaked it into a really interesting love story about a woman who Katie Holmes plays um, facing a hurricane with her family and, and a hurricane in her life and in her mind. And um, really, really interesting idea. Um, but for me, this year, last year, is entirely about spending time with my little boy. So. Uh, one more. Hi. Um, my question is for John. Um, I'm a big fan of um, The Punisher, Daredevil, and everything. I, I just wondered to myself, like, you know, what is your favorite episode of The Punisher? Just, like, filming or just behind the scenes or anything? Oh, man. Uh, it's the Alexa episode, you can say. <laughs> yeah, Alexa <laughs> Davos. Yeah, she is. Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I think my Fave, I, I think I have, uh, I don't know, man. I, it's hard, you know, it's hard to, you know, favorite, you know. It, do you that, watch that them? No, I don't watch them. I mean, that's for, so I don't <laughs> know how it, it, you know, so favorite to do, I, w I, I would say. Um, I, I thought the guys from um, 
Daredevil really really got the the, the Punisher character uh, um, really specifically. I think he works you know excellently as as sort of a a villain uh, uh, or a, an antihero you know and a, you know rather than as a lead. And and uh, I, I I really felt that you know there's a speech by the graveyard that 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 he makes uh, about his daughter about coming home. It was written by a guy named John Kelly who's a um, who was a combat vet uh, marine. Um, and it was just this beautiful uh, speech about uh, coming home and, 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 and seeing his kids and then um, you know, losing them the next day. And it, it just kind of gave the character the right to then sort of turn his back to the audience and be as, uh, go as dark as uh, I wanted to go with it. So I, I would say that. And then there was a fight in that season, too, in the prison, which I, I thought that you know, really Phil Silvera designed it. And it was just really, you know, I, I take the fighting, you know, enormously seriously and the stunt work enormously seriously. And I, th I, th I think it's such a uh, unbelievable opportunity um, to show character through the way that you fight when the stakes are at the highest point. And that's why I really bust my old tired body up so much to try to do it myself because I, I, I think it's such an acting opportunity. But I'd say those two scenes were sort of my, f my, my favorite so far. Yeah. When you say, uh, because I didn't watch them, when you say the uh, Daredevil guys turned him into more of a, a villain in some cases, what was, was, was the Punisher more of a villain on the Daredevil? See, and I'm sorry that I don't know the answer to this myself, I know. Um, uh, no, that's cool, man. I'm sorry, watched, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, yeah, no, I think I, I think that he's been used, um, you know, as as an antihero, or you, you know, he's he's sort of shown as a villain. Then we kind of understand him a little bit better. I just think that the character really serves. Uh, it, it, it really, really works when um, it's not the entire focus, you know. And I, I think it also works as a, a leading character, but then I think you have to sort of start exploring kind of softer sides of him, which sometimes are a little bit antithetical to, I think, who, who, who the character's real nature is. Right, the comics never really... That's what I know the Punisher is, and the comics never really explored that softer exactly. side of him. They just didn't have the ability to do that. Um, guys, congratulations on the film. It's a blast. It's so great. It's exactly what you want a hundred million dollar racing car film to be with incredible actors inside of it. It opens this Friday, right? Friday, November 15th. Friday, November 15th, nationwide, Ford v. Ferrari. Everybody give uh, Josh and John a huge round of applause for being Thanks, here. Thanks, guys.